So we are absolutely saying, and I hate to say this, isn't this how the skills priority list should work? Yeah, that we're actually attracting people into those skilled priority areas. Where it falls down is where students come out of these courses and they don't actually fill jobs in these spaces. And that's always been the one the one thing that I've spoken about is, you know, accounting is the classic example where, you know, where accounting's been on the skilled priority list for what, 20 years? And, and if we don't have enough accountants by now, there's something wrong, but they're not in accounting. We've got lots of qualified accountants, but they're just not there. G'day, I'm Rob Malicki, coming to today from Garrigal Land in Sydney. And I'm Dirk Walter, founder of the Koala News, coming to you from Wajak Noongar Country in Perth, Western Australia. And Dirk, it's fantastic, isn't it? One of these short weeks, four days only. <laughs> How was your Easter break? Mate, great. I, you know what I love about Easter? You get two four-day weeks in a row, and it's brilliant. Mate, Easter was good. Like you say, four days off, brilliant. We were probably one of 10% of Perth that didn't go down to Monday. Yeah, right. <laughs> So Perth was going to kind of nice and quiet. My daughter goes to a Catholic school and she's doing her first Holy Communion at the moment. So Easter at the moment is uh, is very much, we attended Mass on two occasions, Good Friday and, and Easter Sunday. She's now Holy Communion eligible, I think it's called. So she's very happy about that, as, I'm, as am I. But yeah, mate, we stayed close to home, did a few things around the house, relaxed. Kids had an Easter egg hunt, those sorts of things. It was, it was, it was really nice and relaxing. Well, you were much the same. We just sort of laid low. And I must say, when I woke up on Sunday morning and I'd already had the full regular weekend and then woke up and went mm. oh god i've got two more days to go it just is the best feeling isn't it and you kind of prod sure yourself is. and say I, I need to do this three or four times a year rather than taking like a nice big holiday which is great but just those four days really recharges the battery so much i don't know about you but that's counterbalanced by waking up tuesday thinking that you've had four days off and there's a little bit of guilt there to try and catch up so so yesterday was rather a busy one as is today so yeah but it's great great to be able to get out of the daily grind and and, and relax for a few days I must. I'll tell you one last story. Then we we really should get into the news for our listeners. Tuesday morning, so the garbage bins get picked up on Tuesday morning for us, and of course they normally yeah. go out on yeah. Sunday night. Got forgotten on Sunday night, and got forgotten on Monday night. So oh, I was no. trying, coming down the street, and I was out there out there <laughs> in my PJs, like grabbing the bins and going down the hill da, 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 as quick as I could to make sure that we weren't left with full bins for an extra week. So that would not have been much good. Well, I was going to say, lucky it's Easter and not Christmas, and you didn't have the prawn that day was in the bins. <laughs> <laughs> and let's, let's face it, Easter is a time when the government likes to sometimes take out the rubbish. And I'm not saying all of the stuff that happened in the last couple of weeks was rubbish, but there, there was a little bit of trash taking out in general politics last week, but there were announcements from the government just prior to Easter. What's going on? As we've talked about in the past, the government has been looking to strengthen ASQA's powers. And so the legislation for that passed on the 21st of March. So ASQA now should be a bit more in the driver's seat. In terms of the legislation itself, the main points are that they could cause an RTO's registration automatically lapse where the provider has not delivered training and or assessment for 12 months. So I think colleges are now on notice. You know, you can't just sort of sit around and let things not work for a while. You've got to be active over over until continuously, essentially. If you're not active for 12 months, uh, you can you can be suspended. They prevent RTOs from expanding their course offerings if they've been operating for less than two years. So again, there's a, a bit of a caveat there around, you know, you've got to get your runs on the board before you can start expanding. So interesting move. Provide ASCA with greater discretion in prioritizing, considering and deciding RTO applications. Maybe a little bit more subjectivity, I, I suspect there, as opposed to objectivity. And they empower the minister with the agreement of state and territory skills ministers to require ASCA to pause the acceptance and processing of new RTO applications for those one or more classes of RTOs. So again, interesting in terms of, of that. And they expand offence and civil provisions to cover a broad range of false or misleading representations by RTOs. This one, to me, just is a no-brainer. You know, if you're going to misrepresent what you do, you, you need to be called to task on it. So that's that's really good to see. And increase fivefold maximum penalties for engaging in egregious conduct and breaches relevant offences or civil penalties under the Act. And again, I mean, that just makes sense. So it'll be interesting to see now over the next little bit, ASQA's movements on this and how they actually will hopefully ratchet up their provisions and hopefully take some of this rhetoric that we're seeing from the immigration area back into education. And when we talk about dodgy colleges, we're actually looking at what they're doing in an education sense, how they're operating on the ground and, and penalising them for doing the wrong things there, as opposed to the rhetoric that seems to be coming out in, in different portfolios across the government. Yeah, it's kind of nice to have this in place now, isn't it? It feels like it's going to take some of the steam out of that, as you say, rhetoric, and maybe depoliticise mm. it a little bit as well. 
is it does feel like that small number of bad actors is having a disproportionate impact on, on, on the wider industry. So giving those agencies the tools they need to just be able to clear the decks is such a good thing. And I think mm. there's going to be quite a bit of relief when we finally see not journalists walking into empty colleges on main streets, but we <laughs> see Asco walking in and putting up the closed sign. Yeah, no, I agree. So the next announcement was around suspension certificates. So if you think back over over time, there hasn't been an Australian immigration minister that has exercised their power to issue a suspension certificate to an education provider. And that's been part of the ESOS Act for 24 years now. The government, that, that may be about to change according to the government, or they're certainly posturing in this space. So what we saw was a suspension certificate matters specification or, or go through Parliament and the Minister of Home Affairs on Thursday the 24th, 1st of March as well. In Section 97 of ESOS, uh, provides for the Immigration Minister to personally exercise powers to issue suspension certificates to an education provider. So again, this is an area I think that the government will initially posture over and will make very clear to the sector and I would suspect the wider community that they're enhancing their powers in this space. It will be interesting to see whether anything actually comes of it or whether it is posturing. But again, one of those things where I suspect, look, if a college is doing the wrong thing in an immigration area, and it's, I think a college is very, it's very difficult to do that given the complexity of immigration processes and procedures and the laws which govern this. If they do try and do something silly in this space, well, Again, I mean, let's let's come down hard because we don't want that in the sector. Dealing with it through ASQA, through TEXA, and through education regulators is probably still the preferred channel. But yeah, again, to the government's credit, they're certainly tooling up. Let's hope that the when the rubber hits the road, that it actually makes a difference and it's not just about that posturing that we talk about. Yeah, you, you do get the feeling, don't you, that sometimes the threat is enough. Just having the threat sitting there that if you, you know, you're know you out there just to do the wrong thing, that there are all these tools at disposal of the agency to just come and shut you down. Yeah. And it makes it a little bit look, look like less of an easy target for those for those shonks out there. So I, I think that this is going to have a significant impact going forward. And you know, actually, as, as you were talking there, what it really made me think was just like, what are all the other countries doing? Because ESOS was a, a groundbreaking piece of legislation back when it was introduced. So just thinking about all those other countries that have always been playing catch up with Australia. And once again, like yeah. the you know, the screws are tightening there even more. It makes you wonder if some of those less reputable players might look at other markets instead. No, well, you're absolutely right. And, uh, you know, with what's going on in the world, or certainly in the Western world around migrant discussions and bringing down international student cohorts, uh, you know, you're absolutely right. Those protections that are in place, those statements, uh, if I can put it that way, that point out the objectives of each party and the responsibilities of each party that play in that space. As you say, ESOS is a, is a really strong and powerful tool for that. So it, it'll be interesting to see how the rest of the world copes with potentially increased demand if people are moving away from Canada, uh, the UK, and, and potentially Australia. I must say, when I put videos out on my Choosing Your Uni YouTube channel, I just love the fact that I can always point to those frameworks. The fact that we've got those sitting mm. there providing protections for international students, it's just such a good thing. I mean, yeah. along with all of the other quality elements, the AQF and, sorry, Australian Qualifications Framework for those people who don't know what it means, mm. the AQF and other, other frameworks that Australia has in place, it just makes you feel good about talking no, about, about what we do. Yeah, and, and like you say, ESOS is so, so important. But what I love about ESOS is that you've got the national code that sits over the top of it. And for the way that I've always looked at it, the national code is kind of the plain English expression. You know, if you're an institution, this is how you deal with agents. This is how you deal with students. This is your responsibilities. And it's 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 really simple. So it's, it's great, you know, and... As I said, to most people, you know, you should almost be carrying around a, a national code book in your top pocket at times because being able to, to pull it out and refer to it every now and then when you think you might be doing something incorrectly or you might be doing something correctly but someone challenges you on it, it's really important and it's so simple. That's the, that's the beauty of it. We've got our latest visa data out, the February year-to-date data. Tell me a little bit about what's going on there. Mate, yeah, released yesterday. So it's fresh off the spreadsheet, so I guess, of government. I've had a quick look over it, and I've literally an hour before we started chatting posted the first story around it. So that, look, the top line is is that a grand total of 264,008 visas have been granted in the financial year to date, February, taking the sector back to 2018-2019 levels, where there were 265,722 visas granted. It's kind of, on, the, on that point, you think... The visa issues didn't really start till the middle of December 
we've seen the end of December, we've seen January, and now we've seen February come into fold, and we're seeing a pretty big handbrake put on. And if you think that we we're probably growing up until December in the first half of the year, it's pretty significant, you know. And, and I think as I well, as I dig through data and, and as colleagues dig through data over the next couple of days, we're going to come up some, with some really interesting anecdotes. One of those has already popped out. So what I did today was actually look at uh, a number, just a, a random kind of set of countries just to see where they were at based on, on, my, on previous knowledge. And I remember when I did it for January, China kind of stood out because the grant rate hadn't moved that much. I want to say it was you know 96 to 94% or, or, or thereabouts. But China's the really interesting one in, in all of this. So we've, we've seen declines pretty much from across the board and there's some... You know, pretty hefty declines across South Asia. China's actually grown. It perplexes me, I've got to say. So according to the data, there were 42,663, and I've specified this is higher education only, visas granted, and that compares to 37,257 for the same period last year. So we're up 14.75% compared to last year. But it gets better because if you compare it to 2018-19, which was the last pre-COVID year, visa grants for higher education out of China, and again, this is not onshore, this is offshore, so we're talking Beijing granted, were 31,080. So if you count this year against 2018-19, same data set, we're talking 37% up. It's amazing. Do you think this is is linked to that issue where the Chinese governments said they were no longer going to recognise degrees studied online? Mate, I think there's a, probably a, a confluence of, of issues. I think, you know, more broadly, I think there could be an internal issue where, you know, potentially the post in China hasn't necessarily sort of followed the edicts that, that other posts or interpreted the, the edicts coming from Canberra that others others may have interpreted. I actually, I don't know, and I've got no nothing to base this on, okay, but this is, so this is purely speculative, but I suspect that Australia has been working very, very hard on the Chinese relationship and getting it back to where the previous Liberal government probably, you know, let it let it dwell for a while. And if we think about exports last week or earlier this week, last week, there was an announcement around the removal of wine tariffs from on Australian wine. It's my gut feeling. Again, I'm not basing it on anything that I know other than, I guess, looking at how can China grow by 14% over last year? And 37% from pre-COVID without there being some sort of bilateral underpinning to it. And again, I don't know what it is, but maybe we're playing nice with China at the moment. And and that's a yeah, that's a good thing. It's where, where we should be with a lot of countries. But yeah, it's it's certainly a standout, mate. It's a it's a tall poppy. I guess the Australian education system is very well recognized in China. And and maybe there's also like a, a, a sort of lower risk. I put the sort of inverted commas around that. From, from the immigration point of view, where, you know, there's a very strong trend of people, uh, of, of Chinese students coming to Australia, getting the good quality education, then heading home to work in the family business or to, to move into enterprise over there. And the Australian degree is very well recognised. So perhaps the value of that has increased given everything that's happened over the last sort of five years. Mate, I, I look, there's a part of me that wants to share that optimism. Mm. When you think higher education across the board has decreased 18.5% and China's up 14 point, you know, 14.75, whatever it was, I don't know. I just, I think there's something else going yeah, on. interesting. Always interesting, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> just maybe think of it. Always think, interesting. Maybe think of it. The data never lies, right? Made me think about, yeah, exactly, exactly right. It made me think about your, your observation in the last podcast. Around, was it 48 million students in Chinese higher education, I think that was for yeah, you, yeah. 50, 50 million. So we're getting a, a tiny little bit of that flowing over into Australia. <laughs> there we go. Absolutely. And so sticking, sticking on the sort of student data and things like that, AECC have released some new student insights. What's the latest? Yeah, so so generally I think they, they release something once a year and they've released it in April this year. Made some really fascinating stuff. The two, the two points that that really kicked off for me out of this. And again, if you're after the full data set, you can get it by visiting thekoalanews.com and looking for the AECC story. And there's a link which will download that file. I do believe AECC will be putting it up on their website in coming times, but I, I understand that will be the place to get it from at the moment. Mate, the first one's around changing destination. So there's been, over API, there are a couple of reports that came out. Um, the first one was around, was from study portals and the second one's from IDP. And, and both of those looked at changing destination data from students that they had within I guess, their, their ecosystems, uh, if I can put it that way. And broadly, this AECC data confirms 
those, what, or what those reports were saying. And that is that there is, has absolutely been a shift away from the UK, Canada, and Australia and a shift towards or an increasing appetite for changing destination for New Zealand, for Germany, and the USA. And I guess the, the USA more broadly, not so much picked up in this data, in the ACC data, but there's an asterisk above the USA around the Trump effect and, and what the what the election may, call, may do later on coming up or the Biden, the presidential election. Where do we see that? So basically, New Zealand uh, has seen a massive upswing of 86.36%. Now, you've got to think of that from a New Zealand perspective. It's a smaller market, so but massive growth rate or uptick in, in interest in New Zealand. Germany, 36.23%. And again, we've spoken about this in the past where the increase in English language taught programs in Germany is making that more attractive. Lower fee regimes making it more attractive. And certainly I think what they're going to be seeing a lot more from South Asia out of that. The destinations seeing decrease in study uh, in study preference include Canada and that's at 32%. So that's pretty a pretty significant drop. And I think when we after we finish talking about ACC, I think it's probably worthwhile having a chat about Canada because there's some there's been some fascinating things going on there the last week. The UK, fifteen point eight nine percent and you know we've kind of been across that for a while and that's probably been the one that's that's been happening for a bit and that started with the dependent visa back in the day, probably two years back. And then Australia at 9.44%. So we've seen those shifts. Now, the major reasons for changing study destination across the board include high cost. So some of those high cost destinations, 24.2%. Better job opportunities. So again, shifting to a, a, a new area. So that's more of a pull factor rather than a push. That's 1897 And negative policy changes. So this is where we're now starting to see some of these migration shifts that are coming around and some of these process changes. 13.9%. And concern about slow Vs for processing times are showing up. And that's at 12.3%. So that's the fourth biggest contributor to a destination choice. And I don't think, you know, in my recollection of Australian sort of migration history, if I can put it that way, I've never seen slow visa processing times ever, ever. make it into ever. Australia's always been ever, Yeah, ever, ever, ever. I think Australia has always been pretty efficient around all this stuff. So... It's it's yeah really fascinating data. The second major point, if we take it, if we move on from changing destination, is around the length of stay, post study work, and migration. From day dot, we always knew that either staying back in the country and being able to earn a bit of money to either pay off your education, either pay off your bank loans that you may have gotten from overseas, pay back family members who may have contributed to your experience, has been really really important. There's some really fascinating numbers around this though. So fifty five point six five percent of respondents indicated they sought to seek work or further study and then return home. We're talking over one in two students wants to stay on and earn money, but they're not interested in migration. They want to go home. I think what we're seeing here is a really clear picture around the cost of the education, being able to get work experience and earn money and then return home. And again, I would say that's around repaying investment in that experience to begin with. Yeah, I think though, um, Dirk, I, I think that's also just the human factor. I mean, you've spent all of this time in country yeah. getting your qualification. Yeah. You've made contacts. You've met people. You understand businesses. Yeah. You've probably been working a casual job in the community. You've got a lease on your house. Maybe you know you got a you got a pet budgerigar. I don't know. And 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 you want to you want yeah. to continue, you want that that's continued for just a little bit longer. And yeah. you know, often the the younger end of the age range spectrum, I think, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> you you what you're saying is people with less grey hair. Yeah, that's right. shh. Yes, that's. <laughs> precisely what I meant to say. It just seems yeah, sort of yeah. normal to me that that, that, that that's what that's what's yeah. going on. So finance could be part of it. And I just think humans being human, we want to make the most of where we are right now. So Yeah, it's almost it's almost recalibrating that that working holiday visa, isn't it, to a working study visa. You know, you study and then and then work and, and get a get a full experience. So no, I mean, I complete, completely agree. Not necessarily the full plan. The full plan might be to, to get go home and People want to get back close to their families and reconnect and, and move forward back in their country of origin. Makes complete sense. Yep. Wouldn't it be great to see some of these statistics in the mainstream media when we talk about these sort of issues? Wouldn't it? Wouldn't it what? Well, so I mean, if you if you if you kind of compile the rest, right? So fifteen point eight nine percent of respondents just intended to return home immediately, and leaving twenty eight point four six percent indicating that they'd like to explore migration opportunities. So that's less than one in three a little bit more than one in four actually comes here thinking, you know what, I wouldn't mind, you know, actually 
using education as a as a as a stepping stone to a more permanent option. And again, I think that really underscores probably what we've known in the sector for a very long time. What the community may not know in that all these students are coming here and staying. Well, they're not one in four, one in a little bit over one in four are, or or indicate that they'd like to. So I think you know again, this, this is a really a really key message. So yeah, like you say, mainstream media would be great, and and to build that community awareness around these things would be really good. Now you opened a door just a few moments ago, and we need to go back and walk through it. You talked about Canada, and Canada has been fascinating, mm. hasn't it? You've been reporting on this quite a lot over, over the last six months. Yeah, so I'm mate, I'm really lucky. There's I've got two colleagues and and friends over in Canada. One's in Alberta and one's in Ontario. Earl Blaney's in Ontario and Justin Coleman is in Alberta, and hey, they've been fantastic at keeping us up to date with what's going on in Canada. Earl penned a piece uh, this week around the caps and uh, Ontario's suggestions towards the feds around what they do with Ontario. So just to take you back, Mark Miller, the federal immigration minister, spoke at length around saying you know, there's essentially this. Too, much, too many issues going on, there's too many students, and we're going to start putting some federal caps over there. And again, to recap for Australian audiences, Canada is a little bit different because provinces have carriage over education, the federal government has that carriage over immigration. So it's slightly different to what it is here. You can't necessarily control numbers through regulators like you can in Australia because they're done on a provincial on a provincial level. Immigration minister says, you know what, we're going to start capping the amount of student the amount of student visas we're going to offer. What he basically did was say, right, we're going to split all those caps up. And I think we spoke about winners and losers, and we spoke about how Ontario was likely to be a loser, uh, BC was probably likely to be a loser. But some of the winners might be Alberta, some of the provinces out east, such as Nova Scotia, and with the ones in the middle kind of being on square. What the federal government's asked is for each of the provinces then now to come up with a plan as to how those caps will be essentially distributed. And this past week, there's been a massive move from Ontario. And Ontario's Ministry of Colleges have excluded, for the large part, I think 96% of their cap allocation will go to public institutions, remaining 4% to private institutions. So when you think about the structure of the education sector here in Australia, that's massive. I mean, you're essentially pushing out a lot of private players and essentially saying to them that they are no longer able to export their goods and services. So this is I actually think this is going to be a one to watch over the next little bit. I'm sure that there will be pushback from the private sector and it will be really interesting to see what happens. So, but yeah, mate, Ontario has put it out there and, and it'll be interesting to see how, how things pan out. Very interesting, isn't it? I mean, I think if you look at the, the visa processing issue here in Australia, I think most people would acknowledge that that feels like a, a bit of a temporary issue. You know, the politics of what's going on mm. out in the community and things like that are, are kind of driving a government reaction. But it kind of feels like something that's going to uh, blow over, you know, to, to use that expression. I don't know. This for Canada seems more serious. I think what's a cap like that's in place, that's got structural mm. implications. Well, that's the word that I was going to use is structural. Yeah. And it's it makes it difficult. And again, that relationship between provinces and the federal government makes it really ingrained that each province may have a different system. It may have its own views on certain things. And maybe that's how provincial systems should work. Maybe we're not as, you know, this, I think through COVID, we, we certainly had a bit more of a, you know, we lifted the contact paper a little bit more on that, on our, on our Commonwealth, if I can put it that way, where states stood up and said, you know, we actually don't see it that way. We want to do something a little bit different. And to live in a world where that's the norm is probably fairly foreign for us. But for other countries, and you know, the United States is certainly one of them where, you know, state by state, they have very different laws. It's, yeah, it's it's a bit of a mind bender for us. And of course, that means that, you know, attitude shifts as to whether or not Canada becomes like a top choice destination or if suddenly it becomes too risky if, it, if it's too difficult. And maybe that's a good segue into Pearson's research, um, which reveals that migrants are driving the Australian common way of life and outpacing the national average when it comes to filling the country's most critical sectors. I'm reading your text here, Dirk. Thanks for giving me the intro to that to, to, the, to that topic. But let's let's talk a little bit about Pearson's migrant and student study. Sorry, migrant and student study, the PMAS. Yes. Again, we're really fortunate, I think, in this country to have 
some really quality private organisations that have been willing to and do significant research on their cohorts and they release that publicly. So the PMAS is, is absolutely one of those. It's based on a study that was done for over 3,000 Australian visa applicants who have taken the Pearson's Test of English or the, or the PTE. So we're looking at a very specific cohort you know, and, and competitors do this in their own spaces and we've seen a number of those over the last few weeks. So the PMAS found that migrants who had taken the PTE were more likely to be employed in crucial fields, which makes sense, right? So, you know, if, if you're an international student, you're coming here, and if you're in that, what was it, that 24% or 20 Five percent of students who are potentially looking at a migration outcome, you're more likely going to be studying a course that has some sort of skills priority attached to it. So it kind of makes sense. But what we're seeing is, for instance, those who are in the aged care and disability care, compared to the general population, that 3.6% versus 1.4%, four times more registered nurses and seven times more software and application programmers. So we are absolutely seeing, and I hate to say this, isn't this how the skills priority list should work, yeah, that we're actually attracting people into those skilled priority areas. Where it falls down is where students come out of these courses and they don't actually fill jobs in these spaces. And that's always been the one the one thing that I've spoken about is, you know, accounting is the classic example where, you know, where accounting's been on the skilled priority list for, what, 20 years? And, and if we don't have enough accountants by now, there's something wrong, but they're not in accounting. We've got lots of qualified accountants, but they're just not there. So Sasha Hampson, who's the VP at Buson, said, according to to the uh, priority list, more than half, sorry, more than a third of occupations are in shortage, 36%, which is worse than the year before, 31%. Skilled migrants and international students who themselves will likely to become skilled workers are a beacon of hope for Australian economy and way of life. And again, that underscores that we've got a system that's working and, and we should be welcoming and where we do have skill shortages and across our economy, we should be absolutely looking towards migrants to fill those shortages. And what better way to have a migrant fill those shortages than to be educated here and actually understand the context, the culture, and the way in which Australians go about things. It's, it's a perfect fit. Yeah, it's it's a great bit, of, great bit of research and I highly recommend anyone who's interested to, to check it out. I'm sure you can find it on the Pearson's website. So Dirk, one last thing that I'd love to chat about really, really quickly before we wrap up is, is around artificial intelligence, AI, generative AI, and this whole movement. And a lot of people in international education, education in general, and it seems like a topic that people are kind of peripherally aware of, but maybe not necessarily focused in on. So I'd love to sort of chat regularly about some of the developments that are that are coming up there. One of the ones that I picked up in midweek, and I just think I just think this is going to shift so much of what happens inside universities. And, and I just saw this announcement in midweek around Microsoft and OpenAI, who are the makers of ChatGPT, have announced they want to create a new computer. Maybe computer isn't quite the right word for it, but a hundred billion dollar supercomputer essentially just to handle oh, wow. this new type of technology we're talking data centers this thing is speculatively going to be so big it's going to need its own nuclear power yeah. plant to wow. run it and i remember when i saw this article i just thought people need to know about this because if you know if you've tinkered mm. with chat gpt or mid journey or any of these generative AI tools, like it is just the thin edge of the wedge that's coming. And I thought it'd be fascinating for us to just kind of keep an eye on that as we go. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Actually, this morning when I got up, one of the things that beeped on my phone was an announcement. For those of you that, that may follow The Daily Show in the United States, John Stewart has been back on there probably now for five or six episodes, I want to say. And he did a bit of a rundown of AI and it was fascinating from a, you know, obviously a very satirical kind of point of view. But you're right, AI is coming and it's coming and it's going to be a tidal wave. And I'm not sure that people actually understand the implications. And certainly John's take on it was, you know, around the shift in jobs and the changes in the economy, the changes in workplaces that, that this will cause and the friction between is AI going to be helpful in our daily lives? Is it going to create space for us to do other things or is it just going to take jobs and what will we do in that space so if you haven't seen that or if you're available to or if you follow the daily show i highly recommend have a look at it it's a good laugh more than anything else as with john Stewart and the daily show it touches on some of those really key points in a way that you know you can kind of 
digest them rather easily. So, but mate, you're right. You know, these things are coming and they're coming big time. Talking about being able to cure diseases, you know, that we possibly couldn't even imagine now and, and the power of AI in those spaces. It's, mate, you know, when we were growing up, and, you know, the video recorder came out and our parents bought the first VCR and, you know, powered windows in the cars. We never had to had to wind up our windows anymore. You know, I remember my parents saying to me, Dirk, when you're our age, it'll be a whole new game and you'll be saying the same thing to your kids. And I tell you what, I am. It's funny, isn't it? I, I completely agree. And we're in the middle of starting a new business, my wife and I, and maybe at some point in the next couple of months, I'll have more to say about that. But we're using some of these tools to shorten our development mm time frame and honestly marine hook my wife who was a you know former ceo of, of aim overseas was working on part of this project during the week and and i swear to god she did would have taken six months of manual research mm. and work in four days yeah, so wow. it's like it, she still had a lot of work to do there's a lot of detailed work a lot of revision fact checking and things like that the work was different but just the acceleration in the amount of output yeah. and high quality output, if you know the tools and if you use them right, and, and that's not just like a, a plug and play at the moment. You you really got to take the time to learn them. But goodness gracious, yeah. like the impacts are, are, are phenomenal. So yeah, look forward to discussing that more over the coming months. And by the time by the time we're next uh, on the podcast, we will have both enjoyed another four day weekend. So. It's been great chatting as always, Dirk, and I'll see you on the other side of Anzac Day. Indeed. Look forward to it. Thanks, Rob. Take care, mate. Global Horizons podcast is brought to you by The Global Society, Australia's learning abroad support company. For about 10 years, The Global Society has been supporting Australian learning abroad teams with technology, training, consulting, strategy, marketing, you name it. We all know that learning abroad is time-consuming and complex, so if your team could use a little bit of extra support, reach out to The Global Society, globalsociety.com. Today's episode was recorded on Garigal land in Sydney and we pay our respects to elders, past, present and emerging. Thank you. See you next time.